watercolor background techniques. Today I've got four really easy techniques for you. I'm going to walk you through them step by step and they're definitely easy enough for beginners. Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Michelle and on this channel you'll find all things watercolour as well as some mixed media, some drawing tutorials, even some business and motivational stuff too. Please do consider subscribing. If you click the bell icon, you can get notified every time I have a new video for you. I make at least one free video a week here on YouTube on a Thursday with extra content for Patreon subscribers. So in today's video, we're going to go through four different watercolor backgrounds. Now, in order to complete these, I'm going to use some paintings that I've already done. So I'm going to use four paintings that I'd already made in watercolor pencils. Now, these are done on standard watercolor paper. So we're going to put a watercolor background behind each of them. Now, one of them, the Bluebells, is available on YouTube as a step-by-step -step tutorial. If you look in playlists and go under step-by-steps, you'll find that one. The other three are part of my watercolor pencils online course, where you get eight full-length flower tutorials in watercolor pencils. So do have a look in the description if you're interested in that. And that said, let's point the camera downwards and get on with our first technique. So for our first watercolour background we have a lovely poppy, a lovely red poppy and we're going to put a wet into wet background behind it. I'm going to show you how to make this look a bit like some sky at the top and some foliage or grasses at the bottom. It's a really useful background to have in your itinerary. It can be layered, other things can be added on top or you can do it just as I'm doing in this tutorial and keep it simple. So I've got my poppy picture here. And um, when I was painting it, a little of the red did get in the background. It's very hard to keep red exactly where you put it. And so there is some smudging and some marks on the background. So putting a background in is going to cover that up nicely. I want a sort of wet into wet background this time. And we're going to do a uh, almost like a sky and a foreground. It's going to be very sort of semi-abstract. And what I've done here is I've put some Daniel Smith manganese blue out. I've got a couple of water jars and one of them has got completely clean water in. So we could do this in one go. So in other words, we could start one side and work all the way around, changing colours as we went. But in order to keep the colours clean in this occasion, I think what I'll do is do the sky first. Now I don't want a hard line where it ends at the horizon. I want it just to merge into the foreground. So what I'm going to do here is start off by putting some clean water along here, about halfway up. And then what I'll do is I'll start going in with a bit of the paint. And as I work round, I'm actually going to be changing backwards and forwards, cleaning my brush. So I clean in one jar, I pick up clean water from another jar, and then I can go in and get a little bit of a white area there, some fading, and we'll get the idea that there are white clouds here and there. I could wet a whole area like this and then go in with some blue, I want to be careful not to work on too much of a large area at a time because what happens then is it starts to dry. It's very warm here in the UK, unusually so at the moment. So I'm going to be careful and not wet this whole area in advance. And you can see I don't take the water right up to the edge of the flower because I can use the paint to go up to the edge there like that. You can't see where you're putting water easily, so don't go too close to the thing you're painting around. I'm going to continue round now adding water and blue paint like this. So I've gone all the way around the top half of the painting and I've ended up here on clean water as well. What can happen is you can find that the blue just never stops spreading. So what you want to do is stop about there and then get some clean water and go up. You'll notice as well that I didn't have any puddles and that I didn't have any puddles whilst I was working. This is really, really important. If the paint is too wet or the, uh, the water that you put on the paper is too puddly, what will happen is you'll get a load of cauliflowers and drying lines. You want, if possible, for the blue that you're placing on to be straight from the tube or straight from the pan with not too much water so that you're not dripping blue paint on. If you do that, you won't have any control over it. You certainly, if you find that it's not dark enough, you can just let it dry and repeat the whole process. Important to let it dry in between because that kind of sticks the paint a little bit to the paper and the underneath layer won't disturb too much then when you put a second layer on. You could take this as far as you wanted. For example, I could put another layer of water on and go back in and put some cloud shadow or some other colors in the sky. But for the sake of this tutorial, I'm going to keep it simple. So I'm going to let that get dry before we do the lower half. So although it's mere seconds in the, uh, the video edit, I have actually left this one 
for quite some time, about half an hour. It's not 100% dry, but it's dry enough for us to do the foreground. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go in now and again, I'm going to start on one side. It doesn't matter, you could start on the other side if you wanted to. I'm going to start here and I'm going to go in with some clean water. I'm going to make sure that's not too puddly there. Oh, there's a danger that it could make a drying line across the blue. And this will enable us just to get some softness here at this kind of almost imaginary horizon. All I'm going to do then with my, uh, my paint palette here is work straight in with blues and yellows and then we'll make some mottled greens here like so. Put a bit of ultramarine and we can go in like this. Now there's often a misconception with wet into wet like this that you have to pre-wet the, um, the paper. And people have had big arguments with me over whether this is actually a wet into wet technique considering that the paper itself is dry. But I consider that I'm putting two wet colors into each other so um, you know, Fight me on that one, and I have had a little bit of um, martial arts training, so um, that's something to consider before starting fights about paint techniques with me. Now, while I'm applying this, I just want to tell you about my latest course. So I'm just about to, in fact, with the, uh, with the launch of this video, I'll be launching for pre-sale my watercolour techniques course, my newest course. And like all of my courses, when they're brand new, I offer a bit of a discount on them, or rather I should say a lot of a discount for people that buy them before they're ready. So in other words, if this video's just come out when you've watched it, and that would be before the end of August 2021, then you'll be able to gain a discount on that course. If not, if you're watching this video later on, the course is still available. And um, it's a course that will teach you 10 different watercolour texture techniques and we go into things really, really in depth. So if you're enjoying this video and enjoying seeing what can be done when you can manage to control the paint, I do advise you to have a look in the video description and check out that new course. As I said, if this video has just come out, there will be a discount on that course for you. And I'm going to continue now painting all the way around here. I may also as well just go back with some little bits of wet paint here because I'd like this to be a bit more mottled than the sky and a bit of uneven drying will just give it some interest. So as I come up to the final side here I'm putting some clean water up here so that again we get a soft transition between the sky and the foreground. And again, I'm going to just go back with a little bit of wet paint here and there and just make a few drips. And that will give us some little back runs and some uneven drying and just make the whole thing a little bit more interesting. So really happy with that. And in this video, I'm gonna leave it there, but you could actually put another layer on or work back in or even paint on top once it was dry. You could do anything on top, including collage, pen and ink. You know, this could just be an underlayer for moving forward with other techniques. But I think you'll agree, it's gone on really nicely. As always at this point in the video, if you're enjoying this, if you're getting some value from it, can I ask you very quickly, please, to just click the like button, click that thumbs up for me. It helps me with the YouTube algorithm. Since the start of the pandemic, I've had to rely almost entirely on online earnings as I can no longer go out and teach classes. I really appreciate all of you who support me here on YouTube. For my next background, we're going to be using a daisy painting that I made for my watercolour pencils course. And we're going to be doing a background that involves masking tape. It's going to be done in two stages. So I'm gonna show you the first stage here, which is a little bit similar to the first one in that we'll be using the wet into wet technique again. But the difference is that this time we're going to be allowing it to dry. We're going to be applying it purposefully. And I'll be showing you the second half of the technique later in the video, because this one really does need to dry between the first stage and the second stage. So here's my watercolor pencils daisy and we're gonna start this one like the last technique. So actually this is going to be done in two stages. So I won't linger on this first stage too long because we're just going to do the same wet into wet again. But I'm gonna do it a little bit differently because this is going to be an under layer. And then we're going to place the second part of the technique on top when it's dry. What I need is a, uh, a soft wet into wet area. And what I wanna do is leave some areas that again could be something like the flowers we've got here. 
So I'm going to go in and I'll start this side here. Now this is actually, I believe, a hot press paper because when I was working with watercolour pencils, sometimes it's an advantage to be on hot press paper. It will make it a little bit more difficult for me to, uh, to work on. But since this is sort of a textured technique, I'm not too worried about things like back runs. So the, uh, the most advantageous place for me to start would be here by the stem and to work my way round. So again, I'm just going to go straight in with some paint here. I've got a smaller brush too, so that where I go up to the edges of these petals here, I can go in a little bit more detailed with a smaller brush and start working things around. So I'm going in a little bit darker there. And I'm going to keep this quite light. I'm going a tiny bit darker here, but... Overall, I'm not going to do this first layer dark, and that's because we'll have another layer on top of it later on. So this first layer needs to be fairly light, especially in the sort of the middle part of the background. So we're going to go round like this, and I'm just going to start working round. All that we're trying to do is knock out some of the white, and I'm not even going to knock out all of the white, because we want the impression that there are white daisies in the background. So let's get a bit of uh, green here and we'll come around like this and I'm going to actually go in with clean water so that I have some areas of almost white paper appearing in the background and just like before I'm going to try and make sure that I don't let any of those edges dry it'll be okay to have shapes appearing but I don't want any uncomfortable lines for instance where I've outlined you know, this flower here, I don't want a strange, uncomfortable outline just outside the uh, one of the petals, for example. So I'm just going to try and keep all of it moving and all of it wet and just keep working in. And now and again, I'm going to put a little bit of colour in so that we get a kind of a mimicking of the idea that there might be some daisies in the background. So I'm just putting the finishing touches to this. Now, as a background, it looks fine, doesn't it? But um, I think we can go a lot further with this. I've purposely kept the tonal contrast low because we're going to put our masking tape technique on top. But first of all, I need to allow this to get completely dry. Not a little bit dry, but completely dry. I'm actually painting this on a separate day, so the day that you'll see it in the final video. But I'll actually be showing this one in a few minutes towards the end of the video so that you can see the whole process a lot quicker. However, do bear in mind that for this technique, it needs to be bone dry before you do the second part. Next, it's an absolute favourite amongst watercolourists, and that's using salt. But there are a few tricks that will make it even more effective. Let me show you how it's done. So here I've got some bluebells, and again, this has been done in watercolour pencils. And I've got some, uh, some sea salt here, and this is going to give us our lovely background effect. Now this is a spring flower, at least here in the UK it's a spring flower and I think this uh, this rock salt or sea salt effect works really very well with spring flowers because it's at a time of year where we can still get a little bit of frost in the mornings or it could even snow because um, certainly in the UK the weather is very unpredictable and in the spring in the UK you can get sunburnt one day and um, be dusting off your snow boots the next day. So we're going to sprinkle this on, we're going to do it as we go along. The trick to this technique is that um, you need to get the salt on quickly while the paint is very wet. I have heard other people in very hot countries say that they struggle with this. All I would suggest is that you chuck it on literally straight away. I know some people say to wait. I find it best to chuck on straight away. However, if you are someone that lives in a very hot country and you have a different technique for doing it, do let me know in the comments because I'm always interested to learn. We do get some very hot days in the UK, but uh, not very often there few and far between. Now there's no obvious place to start here so what I'm going to do is just start down the base and, um, and add some clean water so that when we work our way round we won't come back to an area that is completely sort of straight edged or with some uncomfortable drying line. I'm going to start by putting some natural colours down here, some real sort of grass type colours. So I've got some ultramarine here. You can see I'm not bothering to keep my paints very clean. That's the, uh, the good thing about these texture techniques. And as I come across the bottom of the stem here, again, I don't want to go in and, you know, leave a hard line there. So I'm going to rinse my brush and then I'm just going to get some clean water and just bring that clean water down so that we have a softness around the edge of the stem there. I'm also going to go straight in with some of this diarylide yellow and just let it 
blend together. Now, one of the reasons I'm using the ultramarine is because it's a heavily granulating color and salt works best with granulating colors. So here we are straight away. I'm going to drop the salt in and I'm also going to manipulate it further in a moment. So I'll give it a few minutes to dry as I work further around the painting and then I'll come back and I'll either drop some clean water around the salt or I'll put some more color on. And that second dose of color, when the first color is just sort of semi-dry, is gonna really help to give a fantastic effect. So again, working with these two colors here and coming across, get a bit more blue in there, I think. And I don't even mind getting a little bit of maybe some earth color down the bottom. I've got some burnt sienna here. Let's put a bit of that in. Again, another granulating color. Any earth colors, any of those warmer yellows, even cadmiums, particularly things like cerulean and cobalt and ultramarine are gonna give you that heavy granulation. It's not an absolute necessity to make this technique work, but it can just help move things along a little bit and you'll get a bit of a stronger result. What you wanna do with the salt is you wanna add it sort of, um, unevenly you don't want to just sort of be applying it evenly the whole way around or it can look you know very strange and very forced so don't feel that you need to put it on every part of the painting I'm going to keep coming around here again I'm going to go in with this warm yellow and I think what we'll do here is make a bit of uh, some bright green I'm going to go back now to these areas here that are starting to dry I'm going to drop a little bit extra paint in there you could do it with clean water but paint can be even more effective what that'll do is it'll just help to um, make those marks around the salt develop it's a very hit and miss technique salt and you can sometimes get a really strong crystallized effect sometimes you'll just get little dots but whatever you get it will be something quite interesting so you can see as i'm working my way around i'm going a little bit lighter here i want to keep this kind of delicate spring feeling going on so next to the bluebells themselves i'm going a little bit um, light bright green and as i come further away from them i'm putting a hint of sort of lilac colors in so the technique that we're using here is pretty much identical to the wet into wet technique that we've used before the difference is that we're sprinkling the salt in as we go around and then what we're doing is going back and then areas where we've already put the salt that are starting to dry we're going back in with extra color can be the same color can be clean water can be a contrasting color the main thing is that you're dropping wet paint or water on top of damp paint and what that will do is that will encourage drying lines and it's going to help those salt techniques to show up so again let's put some down here they'll only make a small effect when they're just sitting there like that so what you want to do is then go back because this paint here is already starting to dry a little bit i'm going to go in with a tiny touch of stronger color. So I want to maintain the delicacy here, but I also want to keep those salt effects. I'm just cleaning my brush when I need to and going back around. And just like before, you need to keep this leading edge wet all of the time so that you don't get any strange drying lines. Of course, there's going to be some drying lines around the salt, but we want that to look quite natural and get those crystallized shapes without any craziness going on. And as I said, you don't have to put the salt everywhere. So I'm gonna continue coming up now. See how that's gone on so dark? It really doesn't matter because we're just going to put a little bit of blue with it and a lot of water, and we'll make that a lot more subtle looking as we come around. I'm coming back on this side and going in again with the light green. Where the light green hits the lilac, we'll also get some nice neutral colors appearing because pink and green are opposite colors. And I'm going to keep working around and keep dropping in the salt wherever I think I want some. Where I've got a white gap like this, I'll go back later on and fill that in. So as I come around to this other side, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put clean water down here. And that will mean that we get a nice join here and that we aren't leaving any hard edges. So I'm going to fill in now and complete this area here and apply a little more salt. And then I'm going to let the whole thing get completely dry. So here's the final result and this is dry now. So you can see, look at all these things that develop. I mean, you really can't tell what's gonna happen with salt. It's really exciting. 
So all I have to do now, and this is significantly dry, by which I mean I actually left it overnight. So it will be but a second of video editing, but this has been left overnight. It may appear when you put the salt on that, you know, the background paint has dried, but be very careful because it tends to stay wet underneath the salt long after the background's dry. So you need to leave it for a significant amount of time. Now, what I need to do now is go and take this to a, uh, a dustbin and I'm just going to upend it and tip all of this off. So here's our result and I'm really pleased with this. Now, as I've said before, you know, salt varies, the uh, results you get vary a great deal. In fact, I've just found another couple of bits on there. What I did actually was get a cloth like this one, just a dry, clean cloth and use that to scrape some of them off because it can be quite hard to get all the salt off. People have asked me if salt damages the paper. It's possible that it could damage the paper. However, there are a myriad of things that you will use in your art that could damage the paper, including tap water. So, you know, it's a matter of how much you want to worry about these things. Now, could I take this painting further and work in further? Yes, absolutely, I could. I could, um, for instance, I've got these shapes appearing here. I could go darker behind them and make them almost like um, buddlier shapes or some other type of flower. I could uh, put another layer on, I could put more salt on. Whenever you go on top with a new layer, you do risk disturbing the underneath layer to some extent. So I probably wouldn't take a layer right the way across this background, but certainly you could work into it further, but that's beyond the scope of what we have time for for this video. Now, have you ever wanted to get a completely flat background, flatter than you could ever get with a watercolour flat wash? Or perhaps you've got a subject that's just too complicated to effectively get a flat wash in place. For this tutorial, we're going to use gouache. Now, please don't complain about my pronunciation of it. I always get a lot of abuse in the comments. There's nothing I can do about it. I was brought up in London. We simply can't say French words. And I've got a brace at the moment. I've got an Invisalign brace and I'm struggling to say the most basic words. So you've got no chance whatsoever of me pronouncing gouache, gouache, gouache properly, but I can show you how to use it. It's going to give you a really, really lovely effect. So for this painting, I'm going to use some of this um, designer's gouache by Windsor & Newton, which is the cobalt turquoise light. Could have gone for something really dark, like a sepia. I'm a bit short of this, uh, this type of paint at the moment, actually. Some of them have dried up. They tend to dry up a lot more than watercolours. And I've just ordered some new ones, but they're not here yet. Now, one thing I would advise if you're putting in a large background like this is that you use a pre-mixed colour. Now, I could mix up, you know, for instance, a nice light green would be good. I could mix up a light green. But if I were to run out halfway round and this type of paint runs out really, really quickly, the paper soaks it up and it dries fast, you may find that you need to mix more and you might not get the mix exactly the same. So I'm going to use this pre-mixed colour here. And all you want to do is you can add a little water to it, but don't add too much water to it. Otherwise, you're going to water it down significantly. Now gouache tends to disturb so it's not something that's great for layering so you don't want to layer other colours on top of it. However if you were for example to get round the other side and find that it was slightly patchy then you could easily put another layer of the same colour on. That's as far as I would go with layering this type of paint. So I'm simply going to go in like this. I've still got some tissue paper on hand if my brush gets a little bit too wet and I'm just going to paint between like this. Once I've done this area here, I'll probably do the other internal areas and then what I'll do is I will start working around from one side here round to the other. Now unlike watercolour, if I have to stop and start a bit, it should dry pretty flat. And the reason for that is that this paint was actually invented. If you notice, it has the word designers on the tube. This paint was invented for graphic artists. So if you were somebody who made advertisements before the time of computer graphics and you needed a flat background, this was the paint that you used. It's basically a posh version of, uh, of kids poster paint, but um, much more pigmented and much more evenly drying. So I'm going to carry on now and paint all of these little gaps and then I'm going to paint around the outside. I will change to a larger brush because there's no point using a tiny brush like this when I've got big areas to cover. But for these little bits in between, it will be great to use this smaller brush. And then I'll move on to a larger brush like this as 
I go round, but I won't have to worry quite as much as I would have done with watercolour about drying lines forming, because if you have a good quality gouache like this, that simply shouldn't happen. So you can see I've started to go around the main area here. Now it looks a little patchy at the moment and that's because it's not dry. Now watercolour paint dries lighter but gouache actually dries darker. So you're going to see it darken a little bit as it dries. So I'm going to continue painting round now and then I'm going to let it dry. So really happy with that. Has got a little bit more drying to do and for full disclosure I did put a second coat on. I really felt it needed a second coat. You'll notice with a background like this it looks much more opaque and much chalkier than watercolour, but that's just the nature of the paint. I think it's a really, really lovely effect. So earlier on in this video, we started our daisy background. We put a very light wet into wet background down and I asked you to let it get completely dry. So now I'm going to show you the second part of the technique. And for this, you'll need some masking tape. So we're back to our daisy. The background has completely dried now. Watercolour tends to dry a bit lighter than you apply it and this has dried to the exact level that I wanted it. What we're going to do now is go in with some masking tape. So I've got quite a wide masking tape here. Doesn't matter the width really, but it does give you a little bit more versatility if you have a wide masking tape like this. What I've done is I've taken a piece here and I've been sticking it to, um, it's, it's rather, I was going to say trousers, but it's rather warm here in the UK, so I've been sticking it to my shorts. What you want to do is stick it to something that you're wearing. A t-shirt is ideal or a pair of trousers and what will happen is you'll pick up some lint on the back and it will take off the sticky so you're looking at removing about 50% of the stickiness if you don't do that you'll find that this could tear your paper if you apply this to paper that's even slightly damp again it will tear your paper so bone dry with this one as I said I've left mine overnight what I'm going to do then is look at these areas and work in you can see there's almost like a flower shape here I want to give this idea that there are you know possibly other daisies or other flowers in the background I'm not going to cut the tape uh, it's certainly possible to do that but I think it would be um, rather harsh if I did that so what I'm going to do is start building up you know and, and you can you can join the tape as well. This is sort of a semi-abstract technique. So uh, do expect that paint will seep underneath the masking tape. And actually, that's what we want. So, uh, you know, you can see here, I can make these little, uh, little flower shapes and any other shapes I wanted in the background. I could go for leaves as well. And I'm just going to build up these shapes like this. So I'm going to go in now and apply this tape in numerous places. And then we're going to go in with the paint. So you can see I've really gone crazy with the masking tape here. I've put lots on in vague sort of daisy type flower shapes. As I said, this isn't a technique for getting a super realistic effect, but it's going to give you a really interesting semi abstract background. What I'm going to do now is take a darker color all the way around the flower. I'm not going to necessarily avoid um, painting over the masking tape. I will sort of try and vaguely go around it. Because of the nature of masking tape, paint will seep underneath, but that's okay. As I said, we're not going for full on realism here. What is important is that I choose colors that are significantly darker than what we've got here. Because once we finish and we take the masking tape off, what we should have is light areas reserved with darker areas showing them up. If I don't go dark enough with this next layer, then it's not going to show up. So I'm going to mix some green and I'm going to use some of this phthalo blue here. And I'll also use a bit of Payne's Grey and any other darks that I feel like dropping in. Just going to repeat the process that I did in the background before, but this time we're going darker and we've got the tape in as well. So I'll start up here. Again, you want to start one side and work round just because it's the easiest way to work. And just as we did previously, I'm going to again go in with different colors. So wet into wet. For example, I can go straight in here with some yellow and start getting different shades. So although we want it to be dark, it doesn't have to be completely um, flat background. It will be far more interesting if again, we allow the greens and the colors to vary as we go around. And you can always go straight onto the paper with blue like this. If it looks too blue, if you don't like the blue, you can just put a bit of yellow in it and that will change it up. I'm mostly going to stick to using the lemon in the background rather than the diarylide because we want generally background colors to be a little bit cooler 
and to recede and then it hopefully will show some of those brighter more warm yellows in the foreground when we take the tape off so I'm going to carry on now and paint all the way around the flower including these little gaps in between so I've painted all of the background now you can see that I changed the colors frequently as I went round so that we got variation and it wasn't just one flat color now, unlike the salt technique, you do not have to wait until this is absolutely bone dry to remove the masking tape. However, it should be fairly dry because things can smudge. So I'll just show you, I'm, I'm gonna get a scalpel blade because I find it easier to lift the little pieces. And I'll take some off here where I started just so that you can see how it looks. So we'll just lift a little edge like that. Whenever you're pulling tape off or masking fluid, it's important to keep a low angle and not pull upwards. The more you lift up like this, the more likely it is to smudge. And so you can see there we're starting to get some really interesting effects showing up. I'm going to actually let the rest of it dry a bit more because it's still wet in places. And then I'll come back and show you what it looks like with all the tape removed. So I've removed all the masking tape and I'm really happy with these effects. You can see that I particularly reserved areas that had a little bit of a, a daisy shape in the middle, even some of these bluer ones at the background here. Now, could I take this further? Yes, absolutely I could. I could go on top with more paint. I could even, if I wanted to, do another layer of masking tape in order to get some more subtle, darker flower shapes behind. But for the scope of this video, we'll leave this one here. Do let me know in the comments which of these techniques you like the best and if you're going to try any of them on your own work. Before you leave this video, do remember to pop into the video description. I've got some free downloadable PDFs there that you can grab for no money whatsoever. You can also find out more about my online courses and also my Patreon membership site if you would like more in-depth videos than I can make here on YouTube. Now, if you enjoyed this video but you're struggling a little bit with your drawing, I have a great video for you that's going to show you the 10 most common drawing mistakes. You can watch that video right now.